Okay, good morning. Looks like we're in after midterm mode or beginning of project mode. Anyhow, just a couple of things. Uh, for those of you who haven't picked up uh, midterm yet, I have brought them again with me. There's also a stack of homework still here that has to be picked up. So if you haven't done so, uh, please do so at the end of the lecture. Um, let's see, regrading midterm two, remember, before next for Wednesday. And finally, uh, project three, uh, phase two is posted. Um, if you have any questions, let us know. Key thing is three nanoseconds, that's what you have to remember. And this might lead uh, to quite a different solution than what you had before. Uh, if you have, I give you three times more timing budget, which means that you have an enormous amount of slack. Which means that um, thinking about the critical path might be a very different thing. Think about minimizing activity, keeping things small, reducing supply voltage. These are the key things you're going to play around with. And by the way, as I said last lecture, you're allowed to take use any logic family, uh, uh, your choice. Um, but don't go for board, because we will see that very often when you go for the low energy mode, actually fancy logic styles might not be the right idea. Uh, simple is good. Okay, so that's the key thing. Any questions? Yes, yes, same deal, four, four words, uh, 16 bits, critical path. Okay, and then we, we, we actually estimate the critical path. We don't actually like, do a bunch of... Simulations? Yeah. At some point in time, we, we're going to have to do, you have to do a simulation of what you think is a critical path, or at, at least subpart. See, if you do, let's say, if you know approximately how the critical path propagates from block to block, you can actually kind of take a bunch of cells away that don't matter. You construct a critical path that consists of the cells that are in the critical path and uh, or what you assume that the critical path is. So you don't have to trans simulate thousands of transistors or gates. You basically pick the one that basically is representing and you make sure you have the right load factors on those. Right, right. Right, so you have to have the fan out uh, correct, otherwise you obviously are fooling yourself. Okay. So um, in next class, I'm going to show you, walk you briefly to a good report, just to give you an idea of what it looks like, or a couple of them. And we might have a redacted one that I'm going to post on the, uh, on the website as well. A redacted one in the sense that I want to make sure that the people, um, that, uh, the people who basically did that basically get their credit and get the use of it. So um, I'm going to try to figure out exactly how to do that. Okay. All right, so what we're gonna do today is a couple of things. We're gonna wrap up dynamic logic. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about layout strategies. As I said, this is gonna be becoming important. And that's gonna be the end of logic. Uh, from there on, we're gonna start talking about sequential logic and then talk about timing, clock distributions, all those kind of things. But um, we still have some work to do on dynamic logic. Remember, the key thing about the dynamic gate is that in contrast to a static gate, the um, uh, output is not always connected to VDD or ground. Ouch. Um, so there's some, uh, sometimes uh, for some values of the output, uh, the output will be floating. And the value will be determined by a capacitance uh, or basically charge stored on a capacitor. And so the way we operate is you pre-charge the node, during times that you basically have a pre-charge time, you charge up the output capacitors, and then you conditionally discharge it. The key challenge with this is indeed that you have a high impedance node. High impedance nodes are vulnerable to noise. If you have something that's really high impedance, you inject some noise, the noise will directly show up on that node. And that's the biggest challenge of the uh, dynamic logic family. So, um, there's a couple of things that really are adding to that noise and which basically gonna make, you have to be concerned about or your dynamic gate might not work. And I mentioned last lecture, leakage is one. If you charge, I, I store charge on the capacitor and leave it sitting there, it's gonna leak away and your value will be destroyed. So number one is um, there's a minimum frequency you can operate a dynamic gate at, that's number one. And number two is that you can fight it a little bit by not making it completely dynamic, but something we call it pseudo-static. By adding, in parallel with your pre-charged transistor, we add another transistor, very weak transistor, 
that kind of fights the leakage. It's just there to compensate for the leakage that might happen to the transistor and keep the node pulled up high under any circumstances. So that's uh, the leakage thing, and this is the approach we're basically going to take, is add the transistor power. Second problem we started discussing at the end of last lecture was charge sharing. If you have a charge stored in a capacitor and then I turn a bunch of switches on, uh, it might happen that the charge that's stored in that single capacitor gets redistributed over a number of other capacitors. As we know, that's going to change your voltage. Okay? And this is especially the case when you have, let's say, here you have your um, output cap pre-charged. And then you go in evaluate mode, but you don't enable the complete, or there's no, the, the, if you enable the pull down network, there is no real path to ground. In, in such a way, the output is supposed to stay high. But some part of the network is enabled. And that may cause, for instance, the capacitance, in some charge sharing, let's say, between this capacitance CA here and CL. And as a result of that, the output will drop. That's not something which is very advisable either. Now the question is, how much will it drop? Well, that's a little bit tricky because it's going to be determined by some nonlinear conditions. Suppose, let's say, that the drop is high enough. That, let's make an assumption. So you have a network here. So you have a network like this. All right. I have a capacitance CL. I pre-charge it to VDD. And then I turn on my clock, my enable clock. But the signal B is zero. So it means that transistor MB stays off. A makes a transition from zero to high, so transistor MA goes on. So in that case, we'll get a charge distribution between CA and CL. They're getting connected in parallel. There's floating. There's no connection to ground. There's no connection to VDD. So we just redistribute the charge between the two capacitors. So the question is, what is delta V going to be? How much will that voltage really drop? Well, that's a little bit tricky to determine. Of course, we can assume, first of all, is that, um, let's assume that MA turns on completely. That MA is turned on and, in, and um, that node VX becomes equal to VA, to V out. Right? You turn the switch on, transistor MA is turned on, and we basically chair, charge chair, and we connect node X to node out. So they should become the same. And in those conditions, we can easily write down what's going to happen with the voltage, because what we have initially is VDD times CL is equal to V out prime times CL plus CA. Right? Or under those conditions, we can say that V out prime, V out prime, the output at the end, is going to be equal to VDD times CL over CL plus CA. Right? Just a charge divider. And of, obviously, if CL and CA will be the same, you see that VDD will drop by half. Okay? So delta V in that case, you can easily compute, is going to be equal to this number here. That's a drop in voltage that I will get. Now, there's one important assumption I made here, is that the transistor VA is turned on completely, or MA is turned on completely, that I really can make drain and source voltage equal. However, it may happen that if V drops only a certain fraction, right? If you have a, if uh, you start with CL high, VDD, CA is low, or v, the node X here is low, you start, when you start charging the distribution, you're going to start pulling it up. Right? You start pulling up the node. If the delta V will be fairly small, uh, you will not get basically VE, VA equal to, or VX equal to V out. Because at some point in time, you're going to have a delta V, the threshold, if the difference here, if this starts pulling it up, at some point in time, this transistor will drop off. If you go higher than VDD minus VTH, transistor MA will turn off. So if the delta V is small, you're not going to bring, you're not going to be able to make V out 
identical to VA because at some point in time it transition turns off, right? Remember, this is at VDD here, this node. Let me clear this out. Let me clear that. Hold. I got a new version of the software and I moved everything again. So if this is at VDD, we know that the max voltage for VX is going to be VDD minus VTH, right? So we don't know if that's really going to happen. But in that condition, we know that the delta V is going to be equal to what? Well, I can say that initially I have VDD times CL is going to be equal to V out prime times CL plus VDD minus VTH times CA. I, if I, the, my trans, I'm starting to pull up node CA, but at some point in time, my transistor turns off. The maximum voltage I can get on this thing is going to be VDD minus VTH. There's no way I can get higher. So this is in the case that V out prime would be higher than VDD minus VTH. So you solve that in that particular case, you find your delta V. Now, which one will happen, you don't really know in advance. It really depends upon the ratio between your capacitors. So what I typically would do is I say, OK, let's assume that it's going to be equal. You solve it, and then you check if you end up with the delta V, which is smaller than VTH, then you have a problem. You solve the wrong problem. So you have to basically revisit your assumptions. OK? So that's an important thing. But in most of the cases, that's the condition we're going to be in. If the delta V is important enough, that's the case we will basically see. You get a pure capacitive divider. Now, what can you do against that? What are the solutions I can come up with to fight this charge redistribution or this charge sharing? Any thoughts? What causes it? What causes the charge sharing to happen? Well, there's a couple of, there's actually two solutions I can come up with right at the hand. I lose charge, right? What should, could I do about that? Huh? Add it back. Add it back, yes. How would you add it back? Yeah, you have the bleeder devices. Remember what I did? I put another capacitor resistor. If I had a resistor on the top, I lose a bit, it's going to pull it back up. So that charge uh, restoring, that level restoring device, or the bleeder we talked about, could work here quite well. If you, you lose some, it will pick it up again. It's, but it's going to take time because obviously it's a very big resistor. So that's one reason, one option. The other option it would be the fact that really look at the cause of charge redistribution. Why does charge redistribution happen? Yes? I mean, if you, you could design your logic to avoid that situation totally, or is that too mm, yeah. complicated? Yeah, no, 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 you're in the right direction. But uh, obviously, just designing the logic to do so will be very complicated. But, but you can do something which is in the same direction. The real problem is that this node X, depending on prior history, or whatever happened before, is at zero. If all those intermediate nodes would be high, right, after pre-charge, at pre-charge and everything is high, then you have no chance whatsoever that you're going to have charge redistribution, right? If I make sure that node X is at VDD at the end of the pre-charge, not at zero, then I connect the capacitors together, they're both at VDD, nothing happens. So what we could do is make things a little bit more complex, but add another precharge device that precharges this intermediate node. So you have, with, and this is driven by the clock. What's the advantage of this? The disadvantage of the bleeder device, obviously, is that they have static current flowing to it. If you have a zero and you have a big resistor there, current flows. Um, this case here, this kind of clock device, um, it's only on when you do pre-charge. So you pre-charge all the intermediate node. Now I say, wait a second here. And you're right. I should wait a second. Because now, what we're trying to do with dynamic logic is make things really, 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 really fast. 
So we want to make all our capacitance as small as possible. And now I start adding more and more transistors to it. It's going to add parasitic capacitance on node X. I don't like that. But it works. If you're really worried about charge distribution and you have simulated the complex gate, suppose I have a gate with many transistors in there, and I see that certain nodes are very vulnerable to charge distribution or cosine charge, then maybe conditionally I can pick a couple of them to basically do this, uh, what I call um, extra pre-charge or pre-charge of intermediate nodes. But I wouldn't do it all the time because obviously I defeat the purpose of dynamic logic. So that's the whole idea here. So it is adding a second pre-charge device that pre-charges this node to VDD, we're all set. Okay? So the keepers help and pre-charging internal nodes help as well. Yes? Why do you care so much about keeping the voltage X at full charge? Well, suppose you have V out. Uh, if V out goes down, so I'm supposed to have a one, a VDD, if I now get a delta V. If delta V is high enough, remember there might be gates behind that, I might cause some faulty effects to happen in those gates. Or even in the worst condition, suppose I have, let's say, I, I put this to an inverter, and I have a voltage here which is two-thirds of VDD. This inverter will be starting basically draw static current. So it will increase, increase power dissipation. But in the worst case, this inverter might even flip, and then obviously we have the wrong answer. So if it's a small delta V, it's, all, it's, all, it's noise, really. What you're doing is adding noise. And there might be some other source of noise, crosstalk, and things like that, and you add them all together, bingo, the thing goes wrong, you're toast. You basically have a crash of your computer. So you don't want that to happen. So that's why you basically care about it. You really like to have your voltage levels, your ones and zeros, as clean as possible. Okay, here's another one that you should be, uh, uh, that you know about by now. We've talked about it a number of times. But it's another one that's particularly, uh, this is uh, particularly important in dynamic logic. Again, you have a gate, um, AB, transistor CL, is a pre-charge. Now what's happening when I turn the clock from high to low? So when I pre-charge, I turn the clock high, uh, the clock goes low in pre-charge mode, so this is low, uh, this transistor is, sorry, um, yeah, in pre-charge this transistor is low, the input is low, um, this transistor is on, we go to VDD right here. Now then, we're going to enable, let me just erase this a little bit, let me clean it up a bit. Right. When you enable the circuit, the clock goes high. Now what's happening? Suppose that this transistor is off. Okay. Uh, what do we see here? We have A, and let's assume that transistor A is off as well. So let's say A is, is, is equal to zero. This node is floating. Right? Uh, we turn off the transistor MP. This transistor goes off. What's happening? Well, in reality, we would hope that the thing stays at VDD. Right? Nothing should happen. But as we know, we ignored one thing here. There's actually a capacitance that clocks, that connects that input clock to the output node. It's the gate source capacitor, or the gate, sorry, the gate to drain capacitance of my PMOS transistor. Now, all those nodes are floating. There's no transistors on. What's going to happen? This clock goes up. This is at VDD. What's going to happen with the output? Think about early days of your inverter. Remember when we did the first simulation of an inverter? And you see you do your transient in your inversion. What do you see with the output? What happens with the output when you go from the input from zero to high? It goes above the supply rail, right, for a little bit, and then it drops. Why is that? Charge coupling, right? You have capacitive coupling. So now you can see here there's a network that we have which has no transistor whatsoever. What I have is CLK, a capacitor, and a capacitor. So here this is CL. This is C, let's call it uh, CGD of my transistor. This is at VDD initially. 
This was at zero. This goes high. What I will do is inject charge into this particular node. How much? Well, that's again a capacitive divider. I can easily write it down. What do I have initially? If you look at node V out, what I have, the amount of charge I have at node V out is VDD times CL plus the charge on capacity CGD, which is VDD minus zero. So that's also VDD times CGD. Right? This node's clock is at zero, uh, so it's ground, it looks like it's in parallel with CL. What's happening after I raise the clock? The charge has nowhere to go because the PMOS transistor turns off right away, the transistor A stays off as well. So there's nowhere to go. So what we're going to have is a joint, we have a new value V out, which is equal to going to be to CL plus what else do we have? We have VDD, or sorry, V out minus VDD times CGD. Why V out my VDD? Well, VDD here is the value of the clock input signal that went to VDD. So there's pure charge conservation again. You have charge before, charge after, they should be equal because there's nowhere to go. So if you compute this now, you solve this for V out, you will see that you end up with a value which is higher than the supply rail. So your clock comes in, it goes high, it pulls up the node above the supply rail. It's, we call this bootstrapping. And that's the name for it. It's like a boot, you trap a strap on the boot, you pull it up by the strap. Um, that's the name they use for this kind of strategy. It's a very useful thing to do because it's kind of interesting, right? You have a circuit with a supply voltage between zero and VDD, and I can create output voltage which are above the supply voltage. That's why it's called a bootstrap. You actually can be all beyond. Now, why is this a problem? Uh, in principle, this looks nice, right? Who cares, right? I get even more uh, noise margin, so I should be happy. So what could be the problem? What, why wouldn't I like this to be too large? Again, I can solve it. I think I have the solution right here. Like that's what you see happening here. This is an exact result of a, a, a clock feed through. Clock goes high. This is when the output is high. But in other cases, actually, it brings you above the supply rail. Uh, you actually go, in this case, it might actually just stay like this till the next event happens. So why would I be worried about this or, or even this spike? It looks harmless, right? But remember, so think about if I keep on raising that voltage. There's a PMOS here, right? This is the drain of my PMOS. The gate is at VDD. This now goes to VDD plus delta V. And the, the body of this device it's also at VDD, right? So it's, it's a P well, it's an N well device. So the, the substrate is at VDD. Think about your transistor. P plus, P plus, N. My drain is right here. My drain, this is at, N is, is at VDD. Now I'm starting to raise this voltage to VDD plus delta V. What might happen? That diode here, which sits here, is suddenly might become forward biased. Which means that suddenly, I start injecting current into the substrate. And current in the substrate, where does it go? Well, it flows to the substrate. The substrate has a resistance. It creates voltages in the substrate. And if you're not careful, something that might happen which is very nasty. It's called latch up. You might have heard about this latch up. Ever? Who's familiar with latch up? Ever heard about this? No? Um, let me, not actually, it's worth just saying a word because it is, a, it is a, a, a doom. And if you're basically not careful, you end up with latch up in a circuit, you're in big trouble. So 
If you think about a PMOS um, device, you, what you have is, let me just get this. So you have a CMOS transistor, you have P plus and P plus. That's a bipolar device. And you have somewhere here, N plus, P, N plus. And they're connected, there's some substrate connecting and some isolation between the substrates. What it turns out is that you draw this all out. There's a number of parasitic bipolar devices sitting here. There's one bipolar device, and there's uh, a second one. I don't know exactly how, I'm not gonna draw it exactly, but one of them goes into the base of the other one or something like that. That's not completely correct. But there's a bunch of parasitic bipolar devices there. It turns out that this structure, NPNP, is a very well-known uh, device in power electronics. It's called a thyristor. And thyristors are very good devices for switching. They can carry a lot of current. But once you turn them on, it's very hard to turn them off. So once you basically enable that thyristor by having enough VBE, if the voltage above the bipolar device is just high enough, like you turn on that diode, current starts flowing, it turns on and it starts forming a current pot between ground and VDD, or VDD and ground. It short circuits your VDD and your supply. And that's fatal. Right? You turn your chip on, something happens, and suddenly you turn on that thyristor. You have no way of turning it off again. It short circuits your supply, it melts your chip. You're done. Uh, is this what's called latch up? Something that is, uh, is again, it's uh, something that's very scary. And it's all based because of the fact that the way, the reason I can get here this bipolar to turn on is that there's resistance in the substrate. So you have the current flowing, let's say I pull it too high up, you start current flowing over that resistor, suddenly the voltage becomes higher than 0 0.6 volt, the bipolar turns on. The bipolar turns on, bingo current starts flowing, you're toast. So what can you do to avoid it? Well, you want to make sure that you never have a high resistive pile in the substrate. How do we do that? Well, we make sure that currents can go to ground or VDD very quickly. The only way to basically do that is by having plenty of substrate contacts. Remember the substrate contract, the well contacts we talked about? That's why you want to put plenty of, plenty of those devices in there. Plenty of substrate contacts, make sure that there's never a long path that current can flow through before it basically is grounded or it reduces the resistivity of the substrate. So very important. So this is also why this kind of raising your clock and clock feed through and pulling things too high, suddenly you start injecting currents, they go in the substrate, they might cause latch up. And that's why it's very important to kind of limit the excursion that this um, uh, clock feed through basically can cause. Okay, that's a little side note on uh, clock feed through and latch up. So but be aware of that, it can cause a problem. Sorry, let me go back. Clock feed through causes a problem in the sense that when you go high, when you have a zero, it delays the action because I have no more voltage that I have to discharge. In the case of the, um, when you have a, a one at the output, it might cause your output to be too high, turn on the diode on for a certain period of time. That's not something we like to see. Okay. One last effect I want to briefly mention. It's a little bit a tricky one, um, and it's hard to figure out exactly when it's got. Yes. Wait, so clock feed through happens with very normal static clock. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So typically, what you do, but there you don't have this case where you basically kind of pull it up and there's a floating node that basically sits above. So it's a little bit different because in, in, in static logic, you will pull it up back really rapidly again to the normal value. So it doesn't going to be sitting there for a longer period of time. Okay, so uh, the last one is a little bit of a tricky one. Uh, suppose I have a dynamic gate, two input NAN, uh, followed by a static gate, and that's for perfectly legit, right? I could have a, a dynamic gate, followed that by a static, that's overall fine. So in this case, my static gate is not a NAND gate, right? This is two input NAND gate that I have. One of the inputs is a dynamic structure, there's another input which is right here. Now, 
very weird things can happen. This is my output 2. So this is my output of my dynamic gate. I pre-charge it to 1 and it's supposed to stay at 1. So this is A and B is 0. I pre-charge it. I have a logic 1 here. Now what happens if I raise the other input of that end gate from 0 to 1? Well, what could happen is obviously what you expect is the output 2 to go to 0. Right? This is 1. This is 1. So I'm going to pull down the output of the static gate. But there's something in between that might happen that would not be very nice in the sense that if output 2 goes down, this capacitive coupling between the output of my static gate to my dynamic gate output. Right? This is CGD again. It's like clock feed through, but now logic signals are basically being fed through. So if output 2 goes down, it will couple back into output 1. And the same thing here, this intermediate node is also getting pulled down. It also will pull charge out of that dynamic node. So output 1 is going to start dropping. And if it drops too much, again, it might cause your gate to flip. And at that point in time, as you remember, once you lose charge in the dynamic node, you're, it's lost forever. Unless you have a kind of bleeder device. So this is called backgating effect. It's kind of bizarre. It's the output... Typically, we think about logic as being forward only. Right? The input goes to the next gate, to the next gate, to the next gate. Here, what you have is a backwards effect that one output of the static gates goes down and it impacts the previous gate because of the CGD, the input to output capacitance. Okay? So that's something to worry about. I'm not going to say much more about it. There's certain things to do about it. If you basically think about your logic, you make this capacitance large enough, you do a certain amount of decoupling between the two, you're fine. So that's kind of the issue about noise. And here are some examples of uh, backgate coupling. You can see here, output goes down, output one. This is simulation. You can see that output one actually goes down quite substantially as a result of output two, two being pulled down. It's just pure capacitive coupling into the previous node. Okay. There's some other factors that you have to be aware of. of obviously, supply noise. If you have noise in your supply, in your pre-charge, during pre-charge, you might be lower, you might be higher. There's a bunch of things that basically cause things to happen. But let's not worry too much about that. Bottom line, think about it. Dynamic logic, high impedance node, very vulnerable to any kind of things that might add charge, remove charge to that node, may cause it to fail. But there's one more important thing that actually is even more crucial, and that we have to think about when you start doing dynamic logic. Um, so far, we looked at one single gate, right? Now we looked at a gate and maybe a static gate behind it, but so far we have done one dynamic logic gate. Now, I would like to build something that's a little bit more complex, a large multiplier, NAT or something. I want to make it dynamic. So what will you do? Well, here's the first idea that I could have. Is Say so I have an inverter. Let's say I want to put two inverters in a row. Inverter one. And inverter two. Is PMOS, PMOS, and this is my input. The input goes to the input of the other transistor. That's my output. This is all the other ones. Is this is C C C C, my clocks. I, that's what you would do. Take a dynamic inverter and I couple it to the next dynamic inverter. Sounds like a great idea. It doesn't work. Why would it fail? What's the challenge here? Mm, mm, well, actually, yes. It, 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 you're right. It, it is because of the fact that you turn both of them on at the same time. But why would that be a problem? Oh, no, no. I, I was suggesting that maybe the clocks were not on at the same time. No, no. So, uh, the problem is when they are at the same time. Okay. If they actually, one way to get around the problem is indeed shift your clocks. Think about what's happening in pre-charge, okay? Pre-charge first. This node is at VDD. This node is at VDD, right? 
Now suppose I want to get a one, let me stick here, one, this goes down, yeah. I put a one here. My input is one. So what I'm supposed to get is inversion at the end. I should get one here, zero here, one here, right? Two inverters in a row, that's what you expect. Is that what you're going to get? What's happening when I turn on the clock? When I enable both inverters at the same time? What's, what's, what's supposed to happen with the first gate? Let's first look at that one. Yeah, this is going to pull down, right? That's what you expect. You have a high thing, you have precharged it, you turn on the chain, it pulls it down. What's happening at the same time with the second gate? I turn on my clock. What's happening with this gate here? You have a capacitance. This is supposed to be one. Yeah, because this is at VDD, it's going to go down, but initially VDD, VDD, I turn on the clock, what's happening? Nothing? This is at VDD, this is at VDD, this chain is, these two transistors are enabled. So what's going to happen with the output? It's going to start dropping. And then, so both nodes start dropping at the same time, Brrr, goes down. This guy goes down, suddenly this node says, hey, wait a second, I'm supposed to be a zero. So I put in time, this transition shuts off, but the damage is done. That second node has gone down already to a certain point. And remember, it's a dynamic node, there's no way to get the charge back in there. So it's going to be sitting somewhere in the middle. So that's a big problem. So there's a rule here that you have to realize is that you cannot couple two dynamic gates directly to each other. Because they all would start, when you turn on the clock, they all start going simultaneously down. So um, here's the rule that I can, as a result of that, the rule is that I should never have a, um, a if you look at a dynamic gate, any input, an input of a logic gate in dynamics should never go from 1 to 0. Because that's a problem. From the time you start with 1 and then it has to go a 0 transition, you have a problem. The only transition that really low is to stay at 1 or go from 0 to 1. If I would have all my input nodes, all my inputs at 0 after pre-charge, then you're fine, right? You only, uh, when, it stay, when it stays at 0, nothing happens. When it goes from 0 to 1, you start discharging it. That's beautiful, perfectly fine. So you have to restrict, you have to basically very carefully manipulate what happens at the inputs of your gate to avoid this pre-charge or discharge. So that's the effect I just showed you. You have two inversions. You uh, apply the input, output one and output two goes down. Output one goes going to go down all the way down to zero, which it should. But output two, as long as up from the time that output one is at VTN, it stops and then we're left hanging here, somewhere in the middle. And we have a delta V, and that could be fairly large. So bottom line is, we don't want to have a transition from one to zero at the input. Because one, it starts at one, and then it goes to zero, suddenly you change the mind, turns off the input, but the damage is done. So a rule is only zero to one transitions are allowed at the input. How can you do that? The problem with a dynamic gate is we pre-charge to one and we conditionally discharge to zero. So the only transition I can see at the outputs are either staying at one or going from one to zero. So that's a problem. Suppose I would like to have only the opposite, only zero to one transitions. Then it would work. How can I do that? So right now, I have either 1 or transition 1 to 0. I would like to have either 0 or 0 to 1 transitions only at the inputs. Very simple way to basically make that happen. Now 
No clue? I can add something, right? What if I add an inverter here in between the two? Static inverter. What's happening after precharge at the output of that inverter? The output is going to be zero. Right? What happens during evaluation? It either stays at zero when, the, when you don't discharge, that stays at one, at the output of the inverter stays at zero, or if the input node goes low, it's going to have a rise at the other side. So you have a zero to one transition. You gradually turn on transistors in this network. Right? So that's the trick. If you look at this network here, what we have is my first gate, let be it an inverter or whatever it is, and now I add an inverter here. So the only transitions at node, this node here, are one to one, right, when the PDN stays off, or one to zero when the PDN is enabled, right? That's clear, right? So what's happening in this network? After precharge, this is at VDD, all input nodes are at zero because they're output of previous gates. We have precharged it, we have inverted it, so they're all at zero. So the PDN is initially turned off. I turn on my clock, nothing happens. Unless this node here, when you have transition from one to zero here, I have a zero one transition here, I gradually turn on the PDN and I start discharging it. But in the beginning phase, everything at zero, nothing will happen, I won't lose any charge. Right? So if you want to use dynamic logic, you're going to have to use this kind of a, a um, interchange or interleaving between a dynamic gate, inverter, dynamic gate, inverter. This we call domino logic. Why domino logic? Well, you know, the domino things, you've probably seen these things on TV or little on YouTube or something like that where people kind of built this whole stack of dominoes and then they push one over and then the second falls and the whole thing, brrr, the whole chain goes down. That's the way exactly this logic works. If you have a chain of gates, um, all the gates are basically in a certain position. First domino falls, that's going to cause the second domino to fall, the third domino to fall, and so on and so forth. You basically have gate one, gate two, gate three, gate four. That's why they came up with this name domino logic. Okay, so remember, when you want to do dynamic logic, you're always going to have to introduce that inversion in there. Now, um, a couple of things that are actually quite useful about this. Once I have this inverter, remember that I mentioned to you that when you do dynamic logic, having somewhere a device that fights charge leaking, this bleeder device, is very nice to have. It's a good thing to have a bleeder device. But the problem with the bleeder device is that when I pull low, that bleeder device basically carries current. Even though it's a large resistance, it carries current. With the inversion, I can do something a little bit more intelligent. I might have my bleeder device in here, this PMOS device. But now, if I take, don't connect this thing to ground, as we usually do, I connect it to the output of the inverter. So what's happening when the output is 1? When the output of, uh, of this node, clear this out, if this is 1, the output here is 0, the PMOS is on. So the PMOS will pull you high. And that's exactly what you want. Right? You're, you're supposed to have a 1. I want to fight, char fight charge leakage. I turn on that bleeder device. On the other hand, when you have a 0 here, then you have a 1 here, the PMOS is off, which is beautiful. Right? Because I want to pull it low anyhow. I don't need a bleeder device. So you're perfectly fine. So this is a little bit of feedback I'm using here. This is a little feedback circuit because I, I couple the output back to the input. But the feedback basically makes sure that I am basically fighting charge leakage in the one mode and turn it off in the zero mode. Okay? So this domino logic, very popular logic style for quite a long time. If you, people do dynamic logic, most of the time it's exactly this. And it's kind of nice. Because it allows you to do two things. This inverter has a couple of roles. One of the roles of the inverter, obviously, is making sure that your logic behaves correctly. But remember also, when you want to drive a capacitance, 
uh, it's better to have an a inverter to drive capacitance. If you have a large output capacitance, fan out. Having a inverter drive fan out is always a better thing than having complex gate driving this. So all logic is concentrated in the dynamic part. All output capacitance driving is done by the inverter. So I can size the inverter very carefully for my fan out and I can size my complex logic gate exactly for making sure I can fastly execute a complex piece of logic. So again, orthogonalization of concerns, uh, saying each of, uh, when I do is divide the functions between the different components, so you're better at driving capacitance, why don't you do that? You're better at doing logic, why don't you do that well? Division, division of concern. Now, actually, that was one possible, possible solution. I just want to mention one thing that was, was raised by your remark. The remark when I said, what can I do against this problem with this charge loss? And one of the things you said, well, I sh the clocks are not aligned, remember? Actually, there's another option, right? If I could have my pre-charge clock, here's my clock that I'm going to use. If I would turn on the second gate a little bit later, right? So here is, um, I have my clock for, let's make two different clocks. Let's call it clock one, clock two. So this is my clock one. I turn on here, you have evaluate, right? This is when we evaluate the device. The problem is that at the same time I started evaluating the second gate and then that was not very nice. So one thing I could do is for instance, turn on the second gate a little bit later. Why is that useful? Well, think about it, right? You have, the problem was if I have a chain of dynamic gates, the first one started acting, the second, they all started acting at the same time. And because the input is high, you start losing charge, right? Now, if I first let the first gate evaluate and wait for the second one for a while till the first gate is kind of done, then I turn on the second one, then the third one, then the fourth one, and then the fifth one. So that would work as well, right? Just turning on the second gate a little bit later and the third one would be yet another little bit later. Something like this. That would work just as well. The only problem now is that I need three, four, five, eight clocks, which is a pain. But be not mistaken, people have done this. And there was a bunch of papers that were published where people had all kinds of bizarre clock schemes to try to get around this problem. Okay? All right, but so, that's what we typically use, is this dynamic domino logic style. So again, here's the name, why is the name domino? As you can see here, you have this chain. First one acts, once the first one has acted at zero one, this output starts changing, it basically enab enables this device, then this might change, enable this device, and so on and so forth. But nothing can happen down the chain as long as the signal hasn't propagated through. So it is really a stack of falling dominoes. Now, remember about static logic? Static logic, we only could do non-inverting gates. If I want to do an inverting gate, I have to have two stages, right? If I want to make an AND gate or an OR gate, I need an AND gate followed by an inverter. Now, if you look at domino logic, by necessity, I always have a, first of all, a dynamic gate followed by an inversion, which means that the logic function I'm going to implement is always going to be non-inverting. Only non-inverting logic can be implemented. If I want to add something inverting, I'm going to have to add some other static inverter, an extra static inverter. You cannot do it with a dynamic gate because then what I need another inverter and I basically would cancel that thing out again. So NAND, NOR, uh, XOR are kind of hard gates to implement easily in dynamic logic. The other thing is that this logic family is very high speed. We'll look at it in a minute. Uh, we're going to look at logical effort of the gate. Um, and we will see that there's some tricks I can do uh, to, to make this whole thing quite fast. So let's look at logical effort of a dynamic gate. So here's the domino gate. 
this is what? This is a two input NAND gate, right? And I assume that I'm sizing my inverter as normal. So the pull down network, three transistors in series, because I have that clock device plus two logic devices. So I have to make this size three, correct? So what is my logical effort of my dynamic gate in this case? Of the first gate was logical effort. It's one, right? You have, I've signed my transistors. Every input A and B sees three, capacitance three. The inverter is three, three divided by three is one. So the inverter itself is what? It's also one, right? It's a, it's a minimum size inverter. So that should be one by definition. And I size it one, two. So you multiply the two, you see that I have a logical effort equal to one for a two input gate, which is not bad. So you see actually that extra inverter doesn't really hurt that much. From a logical effort perspective, it actually is quite good. Let's look at the, um, the uh, NOR gate. Um, here you see that, again, uh, every gate has to be doubled in size because I have that uh, pre-charged device. So two over three. 2 over 3, so my overall logic effort for NOR gate is 2 thirds. Independent of the number of inputs. If I add more gates, more inputs, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, I still stay with a factor of 2 as capacitance. Obviously, your parasitic capacitance will go up. Right? You have some extra capacitance I add. But the logical effort itself stays constant, independent of the number of inputs, which is really nice. It's a good feature. Also says that in dynamic logic, like we had in ratio logic, doing basically NOR gates is a better ID than NAND gates. NAND gates require a serious chain of transistors. Here it's just parallel. So two thirds. While for a static gate, it's seven thirds. So that's a huge advantage. And that's why this dynamic logic family is very attractive. If you really want to go to high speed, complex gates. Now I can do even better than that. I'm going to cheat a little bit. Um, I'm going to work on this inverter. Think what happens for speed. Right? I, I mentioned this last lecture. If you think about it from a pure speed perspective, what matters is um, if when you have a one, when you have a one and the output is supposed to be one, nothing has to happen, right? The output just stays where it is. I have a propagation delay that stays constant. Means if this is one, this is zero, the inverter has to do nothing. It just sits there. It was pre-charged, it's all done. So from a, um, if you think about a, a, um, a transition to zero, things are beautiful. Now, if this has to be a zero, then this node has to go from zero to one. Right? You have to charge up the output node. So you discharge the intermediate node and you charge the output node. That's really what has to happen. This you want to be really fast, right? That's the only transition of the inverter I care about. The one to zero transition only happens during pre-charge. I'm not worried about that, that's pre-charge. That's a different time frame. I only care about the zero to one transition. What could I do to speed up the zero to one transition? Make it faster, because that's really what I want to do. That's right. If I make my PMOS bigger, right, because when I have a zero to one transition, the PMOS pulling up the node, you know, the NMOS doesn't do anything. So if I go away from our symmetrical design, that's what we typically do, we size our PMOS and NMOS in such a way that they're symmetrical. Low to high and high to low transition approximately the same. If I now start doing, say, well, I make my PMOS wider, I'm going to make the low tra to high transition fast at the expense of the high to low transition. So what I just could do, let's say, instead of having two to one, like we have here, let's make it four to one. What it does is move the VM of your transistor upwards. Right? If I make the PMOS wider, I'm going to increase the switching threshold of my, 
which means that if I look at the switching threshold going higher, my input goes, my input is high, and it starts low, it means that the inverter is going to start switching earlier. If I use this, I move the switching threshold upwards, my input goes down, my input goes down, you're going to start turning on the output faster. Same effect. Right, this, if you make the PMOS wider, I basically make an asymmetrical gate with VM towards VDD. Now let's see what it does from a logical effort perspective. It's a little bit more tricky. So now what's the logical effort of this gate? So I do this, I make it skewed. I skew up this thing towards the high end. So the question is, what's the, this was still the same, like this is an inverter, two, this is two thirds, no problem. What's the logical effort of the inverter? Okay. Five thirds, that's what you would think. And, 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 and I can see, your thinking process, and you're overall right. If you look at the average, you say this is basically taking into account the high to low and the low to high transition. That would be the case. However, that's not really what I care about. I only care about one transition. So I'm going to look at logical effort for one transition. So what we're going to do is say, let's look at the capacitance I'm offering for a similar resistance. How do I have to size? Now, what I did here is for the PMOS, I reduced its resistance by two. I, now, for an equivalent inverter, I have to do the same thing. So, an equivalent inverter would be four and two. You will have the same PMOS, the same resistance for the PMOS device. I have to make this four two. Input capacitance here is six, right? Here, so we have the same resistance for the PMOS. For, so we have the same low to high transition. That's really what I care about. I ignore the high to low transition right now because that's something I don't care about. Something that's irrelevant for this particular discussion. So I have six here. What do I see here? Five, right? So instead of five third, I have five sixth, which shows again, it's not much, but it's another reduction in performance. I have an inverter now that has a, um, a logical effort which is smaller than one, a static inverter. And you might say, well, gee, how does this is true? Well, obviously, if you look at the other direction, I'm going to be worse off. For the high to low transition, I'm going to be with a logical effort which is larger than one. So the average logical effort is still going to be one, but it's now asymmetrical. Right? So that's a very simple trick. So you skew your inverter in such a way that now the response of this device is going to be faster. Again, it comes at the expense of noise margin. Right? If I basically, I'm going, to make, I'm going to make myself a little bit more vulnerable to noise margin at the high end, but I can live with that because the high end actually I'm pretty safe in general. It's really at low end of the dynamic gate I'm worried about. Okay. So we have that, so you have the total number, 3 fifths, 2 thirds, 5 six is 10 18. Okay, now a couple more small things. I think this is pretty much what I wanted to say about domino logic. So this is your typical logic gate. You have a feedback device added, um, and then you go to your next gate, next domino gate, PMOS, bleeder device, and so on and so forth. One thing you may observe, Again, if you like speed, and that's exactly people what people domino folks do, they like speed. Actually, you might ask yourself is, why do I have this transistor here? In the first stage, we know exactly why you need a ME here. When you do pre-charging, I, I want to make sure that this network is not on. I, that's why we have this transistor at the bottom. If I turn on the PMOS, I pre-charge the output node, I don't want to have any current path flowing to this network here. Otherwise, I could never pre-charge it completely upwards. So we want to make sure that the pull-down network is turned off during pre-charge. And that's why I have this transistor here. Oops. That's why I have this transistor. 
it just disables the pull-down network because I don't know what the inputs could be. This coming, coming from a register, there might be a one or a zero. However, in the next stages, if we look at the next stages of the logic, we did do this domino technique. We ensure that in pre-charge, every node goes to zero. Every input goes to zero, which means that we turn off this PDN network, guaranteed, because every input is zero. In that case, I could eliminate that transistor at the bottom here. So, which is again nice from a logical effort perspective. Instead of having to, well, let's say, if I have an inverter 2, 2, I can get away with a size 1 for my inverter, for our NMOS transistor, make it faster. So that's very often done. In dominant logic, the first stage, only the first stage will have that ME, and then all subsequent stages, you eliminate the evaluate transistor. Okay? So that's an interesting thing to be aware of as well. So that's all I want to say about domino. There's a lot more stuff to be said. But again, as we discussed last lecture, some, it was a logic family that was very popular for a long period of time. But uh, be, these days, with transistors becoming more and more leaky, it gets harder to basically make it work correctly. And it's only in certain circumstances that we use it. Uh, for instance, memories use a lot of dynamic concepts. Remember, we say about SRAM, we pre-charge the bit lines, we do certain dynamic things to make it faster. Right? So, so we put some charge on there and then we conditionally discharge. That's what we do in SRAMs, that's what we do in DRAMs. There's some other circumstances where dynamic logic works out fine. But in general, I would say most of the logic that's done using automatic synthesis, tools like Synopsys and what everybody uses, you write VHGL, you synthesize it, static logic. Plus maybe some pass transistors here and there within a gate, like XORs, in, uh, multiplexers, these are the things where we use pass transistor logic quite often. Okay, that's it for logic. Now, what I'm going to do is send, spend a couple of words on, on layout, because that's, as I said, it's going to become quite important in time to come. So, suppose I want to do something like this. Complex gate, I have four inputs, one output, I'm trying to figure out how should I lay out this structure in such a way that I minimize extra capacitances, that I minimize area. How do you go along and basically say, how do I turn something like this into a layout? Well, a couple of things that we're going to be aware of is this. If I'm going to do, let's say, in the project, you have to design a bunch of gates. You can say, oh, I'm going to take gate one and design it very carefully, and then gate two, and then gate three, and then lo and behold, now I have to put them together. If you do this in an undisciplined fashion, you're going to end up with a smorgasbord, a spaghetti thing. It's going to be a mess. And things don't match on each other, you're going to have to do a lot of wiring, it's going to be a pain. So when you do layout, you always have to think first about structure. What's my topology going to look like? How will things fit together? Very important. How can I make sure when gate one connects to gate two, that I can just put them next to each other and everything kind of connects easily, like a jigsaw puzzle. You don't want to have a jigsaw puzzle where you have to have intermediate element to connect point A to point B. No, you want to make sure that the parts just connect to each other and beautifully play together. So that's why, in general, if you, lose, you look at design of logic, people use, in general, a strategy which is called standard cells. A very straightforward idea. So if you have a bunch of logic gates, AND, NAND, NOR, ADDER, full ADDER, multiplexer, register, whatever it is, what we're going to do is say the following thing. If you make every cell the same height, we fix the height, then it becomes a lot easier to put the cells together. You have cell 1 and cell 2. I just can keep them together and put them in long rows of cells. And the advantage of this, if I now have a supply rail here, a supply rail here, I just can connect the supply rails by putting things next to each other. So you just keep on building it on. Every cell basically connects to the next one, connects to the next one, and so on and so forth. So you have one contiguous strip of metal that basically forms your supply rail, your ground, and your VDD. 
And then I can basically put my logic in here and then use wiring on top to connect my inputs to my outputs. I you have metal two, metal three, metal four, metal five. Uh, so I get rows of cells, and then I put another row of cells, another row of cells, and then use a space in between to do wiring. But actually, if you have enough metal layers, don't even have to do that. The only thing what they do is just have a row of cells, next row of cells, next row of cells, and then I do the wiring on top using metal four, metal three, whatever it is. Very dense, but very structured. I, Every cell in my library has the same height, so everything connects to everything. And the only thing I change around is the width. If I have an inverter, it's very narrow. If I make a full adder, you have more transistors, I make it wider. Okay? So this is what almost every design these days is done using this style. Obviously, it's, you could do better. You could make things smaller if you really want to, but it's going to cost you a whole amount of pain. And it's going to be very hard to automate it. And today in design, it's very important to have tools that help you. You don't want to do it all by hand. It says, here's my logic, here's my cells, now place the cells, put them in rows, route the darn thing up, and we're done. I don't want to do that anymore. It's a lot of work to put every single wire down. So that's the majority of designs are done this way. It's the same height for every cell, varying width. Um, sometimes people might still want to do something different, and the only exception that I know is memories. Obviously, memories are arrays. That's a different thing. You have a whole array of cells, so that's very easy. It's doing something, I have one memory cell, I want to make a thousand memory cells, it's easy. Row, 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 column, 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 bing, you're done. It's a beautiful array structure. The other thing that you might want to do occasionally is when you do, for instance, a data path. In a data path, like uh, something that does adders, multipliers, uh, shifts, ALUs, all those kind of things. There you might want to use another strategy because you know that every bit is the same. Right? You have a 30-bit data path. Bit 0 does the same thing as bit 16, as bit 18, and so on and so forth. So in those circumstances, what you might want to do is say, I create my data path, and I have my different bits. Say so this is an adder. Then I'm going to go to a multiplexer. Same thing. Here, it's just the opposite. What you want to make sure is every bit has the same width. And the only thing I'm going to vary is the height. Can you see that? If I want to do 32 bits, I want to make them nicely aligned with each other. This is bit 0, this is bit 1, bit n, so on and so forth. So you basically create slices. That one adder bit, one multiplexer bit, one register, one ALU bit, whatever it is. So you create slices, and you want to make sure they kind of connect nicely together by just putting on top of each other. So in this case, you do just the opposite. You fix the width so that every adder, every multiplexer fits nicely on top of each other. And the only difference here is the height. So that's a slightly different circumstance. That's what we could use a data cell or data pod cell. But most of the time, we're going to talk about this one here. So standard cell is the common strategy. So that's the way it used to be done in the old days. Rows of cells, rows of cells, and wiring that goes in between them. In between them, we had places were dedicated for only wiring. And that's the only thing you could do when you only had two metal layers. And that's not that long ago, about 20 years ago or something like that. <laughs> uh, we had only two metal layers, so you didn't have the choice. You couldn't put the, the if your cell uses metal one and metal two, and you want to make connectivity between the cells, you have to put it somewhere else, so you have to put it in between the cells. Nowadays, we have metal three, metal four, metal five, metal six, metal seven, metal eight, it's easy to say, well, I'm going to put my cells closer together, and I put the wiring on top. Easy thing to do, so you save space. It makes it denser, which is nice. So this is the old style. A standard cell, you can see rows of cells, and in between the spaghetti wiring. By the way, this is not done by hand. This is done by computer. You tell it basically, it places the cells, and I say, rot it up, and it will figure out how to put the different strips of wires down 
in such a way that everything is connected. This is the way it looks like now. This is the modern design. You don't see anything anymore. It's really boring. Actually, you look at the latest Intel processors, and you look at the chip, there's nothing to be seen. <laughs> it's a whole bunch of rows and rows and lots of wires and metal, and you don't even see the side of the transistor anymore. Transistor somewhere in the bottom of the thing. Really boring chip diagrams. In the past, they used to be exciting. You almost could see what a chip was doing by looking at the layout. I remember the best chip I've ever seen was, it, it was in the... Uh, in the 80s, it was a chip that was done at CMU for playing chess. Uh, there was time basically trying to find an artificial machine that could basically be the world champion or something. And chess was a very important thing. So they built a processor, had 64 processors, one for every space in the chessboard. So you looked at the chip, you could exactly see this is a chessboard. Uh, you could know what it was doing by just counting the number of uh, arrays on the die. Not anymore. So this is a standard cell methodology, and I think if you're going to do the project, think the same way. If you want to do layout, layout in phase three, that's the way you have to think about it. Think about structured layout methodology. So the way we do standard cell, as I said, you have a metal strip on the top, which is VDD. You have another metal strip at the bottom, which is ground. What we typically do is we make some decisions on how we orient transistors. And then um, the current methodology puts the transistors horizontally. So here's a strip of diffusion, and diffusion, and diffusion, P diffusion, P diffusion. Then your inputs come in vertically using polysilicon strips. And then you use metal one or metal, metal two, metal three to basically create ver horizontal connections. So this gate is what? What gate is this? What function does it implement? After a while, you sh you're going to be able to read layouts quite easily. What do you think it is? It's clearly there's two gates, right? What's the second gate? Verder. So is the first one. First one is an amp, right? So you see here, two transistors in series. Right? And these are two transistors in parallel. So there's an AND gate followed by an inverter, it's an AND gate. This is a two input AND gate. Very structured, as you can see, polysilicon strips, uh, diffusion strips in, in the horizontal direction, inputs come in vertically. And then you can play with the width of the devices. If you want to get wider devices, you have to change the width of that diffusion to a certain extent. Right? Let's say for a PMOS or something like that. Now, one thing you're going to have to do is, obviously, you're going to do wiring. And I don't want to do the wiring on top of it. So a good design practice is, how do you choose the height? So you have to choose the height of the cell, right? That's the first choice you're going to make. How high will I make it? And there's a couple of options here. But the way it's typically done is say, well, how many wires do I like to put on top of my cell? Let's say I want to put metal two wires. Well, we know that metal two wires, let's say in certain technology, is three lambda. Let's say you have a 90 nanometer technology, where we say for metal three, the minimum width is 270 micro nanometers, the minimum pitch is 270 nanometers. Right? So it means that every metal three wire has to be 540 nanometers apart, double one. So you have the wire spacing, wire spacing. If I would like to put 10 wires on top, then 10 wires times 540 nanometers is about 5.4 micron. And that's going to set aside the height of my cell. So I'm just going to try to determine how much wiring do I want to have. And let's make sure I have enough. Like in this case, we use 12 metal one or metal three layer type things, 12 tracks. And that's the cell height. We set it to that. Then you put VDD and ground. Now, be careful with your VDD and ground. Um, Actually, one trick we're going to use to make our layout denser is by, if you have a row of cells and have the next row of cells, rather than just putting them next to each other, what I'm going to do is flip the next thing around. So this is ground. This is ground. I can share the ground wire between the two cells and also substrate contracts. So you can see here, this is my VDD wire. 
If I put the next cell to it, it's going to have another VDD uh, to a certain extent, well, just extend a little bit, and you can see that some of the substrate contacts will be shared. And the same thing with the ground. Okay? And inputs and outputs. So that's standard cell. So here's, um, now you can play some games. It depends upon the technology how you're exactly going to lay it out. Right? Like for instance, if I, remember if I have, uh, what's really mattering is uh, if you look at the size, if you look at this is my PMOS device, this is my NMOS device, they're horizontal. So this is my NMOS device. PMOS device current flows in this way. If I have um, uh, a, a traditional alt process, um, in that case, what you try to do is um, remember that if you have a white transistor like this, if you put only one contact hole in there, the resistance of the device is going to be fairly large because the current is going to have to spread out from that one single contact. And typically what you try to do is put as many contacts as possible in such a way that the current evenly divides and that the resistivity of your source and your drain is minimized. However, when I have a silicided solution, where you put silicide on top of the polysilicon to reduce the resistance of the silicide, that doesn't matter anymore. In that case, I can basically pull the outputs of my transistor here, the drains of my transistor and the contacts to it as close as possible to the output. Uh, same thing, you can see this a slight differentiation in how you do the layout based on the fact of how much resistivity I have in the drain source regions. If I have a better process, with silicides, which reduce the resistance of the diffusion, you're better off. You can get away with less contacts. And I also, like in this case here, I maximize the amount of metal. Here I didn't care, so I can use more silicon diffusion routing because it doesn't make that much of a difference. So this is kind of the preferred way today. Is you, you make your metal strips short and you bring the PMOS and the NMOS as close as possible to the regulator as they can to minimize capacitance on this node here. Okay, then you can put gates together. This is a two input gate, and gate, and so on and so forth. Now, that's good. It's easy, but the question now is, and the question we have to answer, if I now have to put a bunch of gates together, or I have to make a complex gate, something that has a very complex equation, what's the best way to lay it out? Right? We already decided that the transistors are gonna be horizontal, and we have a certain height. Now, the freedom you still have is, how do I order my inputs? Say I have something like A plus B and C. Do I order my inputs A, B, C, or A, C, B, or C, A, B? And remember some of those things like an adder, it's important that you bring the critical signals as close as possible to the output. There's some things that play. And there's a number of plays, things, and it matters. How you order those inputs matters not only for the performance, but also for the layout area. Depending upon how you choose your choices, you make the choice of your input, you end up with something that's easy to implement or something that's hard to implement. The question is, how do you cite that? Well, the first thing we always do is this type of game. If I start with the gate, gate I always start putting together some of this, what's called a stick diagram. Stick diagram is, is purely topological. It says, okay, Input A is left of input B. There's no sizes on this thing. Every transistor, every wire has the same width. It's just a line. But it already determines where I'm going to put contacts, what metal layers I'm going to use for every wire, and so on and so forth. And it determines how the transistors are going to be related with respect to each other. <coughs> so it's a very useful tool. But then it's, you still have to say, is this A, B, or B, A? What should I do? <coughs> Well, there's some tricks and there's some important things to be played around there. <coughs> Sorry. But that's something I'm going to talk about in the next lecture. Okay? Uh, I need about another 10 minutes on this and then we're going to start talking about registers. Okay? All right. See you next Wednesday. And again, if you